Somebody take a hymnal. Let's turn to page 106, first and last. Praise Him, praise Him as we stand. Praise Him.
Lord's house this evening. We appreciate that singing, the adult choir and the youth choir. Uh, Dr. Love, we appreciate the message this morning. It's a marvelous message on taking care of and educating, raising children and grandchildren. We appreciate that. Men, if you would come on in, we'll prepare to take the, uh, the offering this evening. Uh, two or three things we will re-mention. Uh, next Sunday, the 29th, uh, the church will open the doors for new membership. If you're interested in becoming a part of this family, please uh, uh, talk, talk with the secretary, get on the pastor's schedule. Also, August the 3rd, 7 p.m., that's Friday, August the 3rd, the youth choir will be seen at the Cherokee County Camp Meeting. Uh, please make sure we're praying for them and having everybody in their place and on time. Uh, also, uh, 10 a.m., this is coming up August 18th, there'll be a combined sowers and reapers visitation. Let's go ahead and get that on our calendars as well. Uh, and if you would, let's worship as we take up the tithe and offering. Uh, Brother Iverson, if you'll join me on the platform, please. o'clock for the uh, gentlemen that are heading toward Redfield. I know there's a number of ladies and families heading down at different times, but nine o'clock from here will the, uh, the van will leave with the young men and men that are taking off from this I place just, uh, down to Ringgold, Georgia for the Redfield camp meeting. Uh, Brother Ivers, if you would, ask the Lord's blessings on the offering. Go home. Let's pray. Father, it's sure good to be back in your house this evening. I thank you, dear God, for the Lord's day. Thank you for what you did for us this morning. I pray, dear God, for uh, Brother Love and uh, Brother Atkins, Lord, as they take on this venture at the school, I pray, God, you'd give them discernment, give them wisdom. I pray, God, that we would just, uh, Lord, we would support them in every way. Thank you, dear God, for just opening doors for them. I pray, God, that you'll just come and meet with us tonight. Thank you for the message we heard this morning. Lord, I want to pray for that, uh, that young Henry girl. I pray, God, you'd touch that family and touch that little girl. And, Lord, give them grace, Lord, like they've never seen before. And, Lord, they're going to need it. There's some dark days ahead. I pray you help them, Lord. And I pray, Father, you'll help my pastor and his family to get home safely. And, Lord, we sure do miss them. But, Lord, God, we've had a good time in the house of God today. And I, I love you and thank you. Thank you for this place. Thank you for these people. Lord, they've become my family and I love them. And I pray, God, that you'll, Lord, bless everything we do tonight. Bless these offerings, these tithes, Lord. I pray, God, that uh, you use them for the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord, help us to be good stewards with your money. I pray, God, you'll touch Brother Jonathan Smith tonight. Lord, help him to preach. God, may we gladly receive the message you have for us tonight. I believe you have something for me. And, Lord, I pray that nothing would get in the way and we would gladly receive it. I love you tonight. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You see me crying and know of my pain. Don't say trusting God is in vain. He draws nearer to troubled souls. Trials are worth more than gold. 
through fire and water, if that's where he leads, I am willing to go. Well, if more like Jesus I'll be, trials are worth more than gold. Moses and Daniel and prophets of old, they were tried by Satan, I'm told. And we must walk the very same road. Trials are worth more than gold. Through fire and water, if that's where he leads, I am willing to go. are worth more than gold. If more like Jesus I'll be, trials are worth more than gold. All right, well, the men are getting ready. Just a reminder, coming up August the 5th, our pastor's 16th anniversary. We want everybody to be present. Make sure everybody's prepared to bring a well-filled basket, go across the road, enjoy the dinner immediately following the service. Uh, it means a lot for the man of God for everybody to stay. We said it this morning. We'll say it two or three more times. But bring enough for you and your family and maybe a half a dozen visitors or so, and let's really do a bang-up job coming up Sunday, August the 5th. Amen. Amen. I've never got over that I am not under the bondage of sin anymore. Well, I'm still amazed that Jesus would pay a debt I could not afford. And I've never got past that I'm free at last from the sin that made me a slave. I still feel as much as when he first touched me. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. I'm amazed to know how far God would go to set a lost man free. I'm still in awe that he gave his all for an old sinner like me. I've never got over that this king would shoulder my sin with all its disgrace. Yes, Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. Amazed a stranger would accept a manger in trade. Or kingly throne I'm still at a loss Why'd he take the cross Instead of a street of pure gold This lowly king Who gave everything in exchange For a cold dark grave I still love to ponder This God-given wonder Oh yes, I'm still amazed well, I'm amazed to know how far God would go to set a lost man free. I'm still in awe that he gave his all for an old sinner like me. I've never got over that this king would shoulder my sin with all its disgrace. Yes, Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. I'm amazed to know how far God would go to set a lost man free. I'm still in awe that he gave his all for an old sinner like me. I've never got over that this king 
what shoulder my sin with all its disgrace. Yes, Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. I've never got over that this king would shoulder my sin with all its disgrace. Yes, Calvary's hill still gives me a thrill. Oh, yes, I'm still amazed. All right, we mentioned it in the prayer room, but everybody be aware the pastor, I believe, will be heading home tonight. Uh, possibly the whole family driving all night to get to their respective homes. Pray for them. Uh, Lord, give them traveling grace and make everything smooth and uneventful. And they get back home safe quickly. Now, here we have uh, Brother Jonathan Smith. Pray for him. Let's give him our undivided attention as he preaches. Brother Smith. I mean, glad to be in the house of God tonight. Appreciate the message this morning. That was spot on. Um, I'll have to repeat what a gentleman told me when I was preaching, filling in for a pastor, Brother Love. A gentleman walked up to me and he said, you didn't step on my toes the first time. He said, you kicked me in the rear end the whole time. And, <laughs> and uh, I needed that this morning. And uh, tell you, I'm thankful for a principal that ain't afraid to get up and tell it like it is. And uh, I know what he's getting into. I've been in those shoes before and uh, uh, not selfish one bit. Have at it. <laughs> And uh, I know I, it's, you can pray for somebody entirely different when he's been in their shoes before. And uh, I'm going to tell you, he's got a battle ahead of him like you have no idea. And, uh, but he can do it, just like he said, as long as we're praying for him, supporting him. And I'll get in a little bit of that in the message tonight. But um, you say, well, I, I don't agree. I am, I'm probably not going to agree. Well, you probably didn't agree with the previous principles, and you're not going to agree with the ones to come. I don't mean you can't support them. And uh, people don't agree with you either. Get over it, Hoss. <laughs> and uh, it's just one of those things. you got to learn to disagree and move on. And uh, that shows maturity. And, uh, and uh, I, I'll never forget what somebody told me one time. said, you learn an entirely different type of people when you're in the education business. They're one way at church, but at the schoolhouse, Lord, help. <laughs> and they show their true colors over there. So uh, <laughs> fashion your seat, belt, bow, love. <laughs> And he knows that. He's experienced. He, he knows. And uh, we're behind you. We're praying for you. We support you. And uh, uh, I, hope, I hope I never find myself being the one that's on the other side against him. And, uh, again, I, if I was principal of school, he probably wouldn't agree with everything I did either. But I know he would support me. So I want to be the same way. And uh, appreciate that message this morning. I appreciate a church that is founded on the truth. I appreciate a church that is King James only. Uh, if it wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. And I uh, appreciate our Sunday school. Uh, it, it, I, you, you don't know until you go to other churches uh, what kind of mess the Sunday school classes are in. And I appreciate ours. I appreciate last Sunday morning, Brother Rick Ivester. I'll tell you, brother, it was fabulous. <laughs> you just had to be in there yes, last week to understand that. And I'm going to tell you, I appreciate men that will just get up and tell it like it is. And uh, if you'll just bear with me a minute, I'm nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. And uh, I'm always nervous when I'm preached, but you'll find out here shortly why I'm so nervous. And, um, but I'm thankful. I, I wanted to preach on, is God fair? That's what I wanted to preach on. That's what I was, I was settled to preach on. And the uh, Lord just would not let me do that. And what I'm preaching on tonight, I have never preached before. This is fresh off the oven. Matter of fact, some thoughts were just jotted while the choir was singing here tonight. And uh, so that's why I'm really nervous tonight. So this becomes a flop. Um, it's my fault, but the Lord didn't quite give me complete direction until uh, about 30 minutes before church started, uh, before we came to church. Um, I started getting direction, and I can't write or type that fast. So um, I'm just going to try to say what the Lord's led upon our heart, and we'll go to the house. I told Brother Brian and back here a while ago, I said, I think we just need to dismiss and go home. <clears throat> and uh, he said, "He said God's strength is made, uh, hang on, my, I'm so nervous, can't even think straight. He said, God's strength is, is no, 
made perfect in weakness. And uh, I can't preach tonight. I'm not even going to try to. But I do need his touch. And I uh, ask you to pray that God will touch me. If you'll open your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 7. Like I said, I wanted to preach on, is God fair? But that is not where God wants me tonight. You would think that maybe while I'm preaching tonight, you might see a little bit of that slip out in this message because it kind of carries the same uh, theme, if you will. But uh, I'll try to be just brief. Preach what God laid upon my heart. We'll go to the house. If nothing else, this is for me. So just sit down and enjoy the ride. 2 Samuel chapter number 7, verse number 1. If you'll stand for the reading of God's word. 2 Samuel chapter number 7, verse number 1. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in an house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said unto the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart. For the Lord is with thee. And I'm interested in the, the phrase in verse number 2 where it says, See now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for the privilege of being here tonight, Lord. I'm unworthy to be, be here, Lord. I, but Lord, I'm thankful, Lord, that you put that call into my life, Lord, many, many, many years ago. And and, Lord, I'm just thankful for the privilege to preach your word. Lord, I, I know, Lord, there's a lot of people here tonight that could do it better, Lord. But I love what I do, and I, and I love the calling you place in my life. And, Lord, I, without a shadow of a doubt, I know this is where we need to be tonight, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that you settle my nerves, settle my heart, settle my mind, settle my thoughts, Lord. And, Lord, we'll give you honor and glory for everything that will be done here tonight. And we're asking in Jesus' wonderful name I pray. Amen. Just to update you real quick on kind of on me real, just so you kind of know, some people are like, well, what's going on with the Smith family is, well, just fast forward real fast. Lord called us into the ministry and we went to South Georgia and was kind of assistant pastor and school administrator for a little over six years. And then God had a different plan for us and I am still trying to figure that plan out, Brother Galloway. And uh, we're, we're sitting here and no doubt that I'm, at the right church that I'm supposed to be, being a member, don't have any position per se in a church or anything full time. And I, last year, I began to question God a little bit, saying, Hey, God, I don't think you understand that I have a desire to do something, which is kind of where the, me the message was born. The ones that Jubilee heard it on Is God Fair? And the question is not tonight on whether is God being fair to us or not. The question should be, is God getting the glory for what he's doing in our lives? And we, we lose focus. We think it's about us and we think it's about a lot of things. And God doesn't care. As it, it don't, you know what I'm saying. He doesn't really care about what you think is fair or not. He has a plan. He has a, 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 a master plan, if you will. And there are certain steps that have got to happen to get there. And it doesn't matter if it's on your time or not. He knows what he's doing. He's always been in control. He's in control. And he always will be in control. So last year, I began thinking, I was like, Lord, I want to do something. And I've always had a dream about serving in the military. And those that are here, you know the pride that comes with um, being serving the military and the respect you have for the flag and and when I got out of high school I wanted to be a Navy SEAL you wouldn't know that by looking at me now that was many pounds ago and a lot of other stuff but I wanted to be a Navy SEAL and I began to pursue that a little bit and my dad told me he said son he said you can do whatever you want to but I ask you that you would just give me one year at Bob Jones University and if after you do that first year at Bob's University, you can do whatever you want to do. So I was like, okay, all right, that's fair. You know, my dad's invested 18 years into me up to that point, And I'll give him one year of college. But I'll have you know that as soon as I get done with this year of college, I'm going to go join the Navy. And I'm going to do my best to try to become a Navy SEAL. Well, obviously you can tell that never happened. <laughs> 
And uh, so within the first year of college, I began to get into, I met a girl and kind of things went from there. You can kind of fill in the blanks. So I got away from that, and, but I've always loved the Navy. I've always been partial to them and the Marines. And, and, and I've always had a desire, and my wife off and on throughout the years of being married, we've been married almost 15 years, and, and she's just like, well, why don't you just do it? And then you'll find, you know, do four years, and then at least you say you did it. And if you like it, stay in it, not, and so forth. And you know how wives sometimes will tell you that, but not really mean it. <laughs> well, I was sitting on the couch last year, and I was just sitting there, and I always stay up to date with the Navy and new things and this and that. And, and I watched this chaplain get on there, and my blood began to boil. He was Muslim. He had the little do-rag on his head. And he said, I'm proud to be a Navy chaplain sharing my faith with all of these sailors. Now, if you know anything about a Navy chaplain, they serve the Navy and the Marines. He's Muslim. And I said, here's a guy on a, a nation that is founded on God, one nation under God, allowing a Muslim to, to try to pervert the minds of people that don't know God to a religion that is everything... That is against God. Yeah. I looked at my wife and I said, I'm signing up for the Navy tomorrow. I began to pursue that path and I began to talk to Brother James Jones. And he, you know, he was a Marine and he said, son, he said, I think you'll be good for it. He said, you kind of grew up a little bit being away from family. You kind of understand. He said, you won't have some of those hardships. But he said, I'll tell you one thing, son. You better make sure it's the will of God. Because he said, you're going to have more problems than dealing with just a Muslim chaplain. And I began to pray. I was like, Lord, if you would not allow that to happen, he said, just let everything fall in place. But if it's not your will, just close the door. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. You say, the, the next statement I'm fixing to make, it may be of God and it might just be one of those things that just happen. But nevertheless, the results of it is the same. I was playing basketball with the men Last year at, at the court back there and give, having a good time and my Achilles tendon ripped right slap in half. You say, what's that got to do with anything? The Navy won't touch me anymore. So be careful what you ask for. God just might close the door that you asked him to close. Yeah, yeah. You say, what are you trying to say? I'm getting to my message and I just bear with me. Sometimes we think God's not fair. We think that things are not going the way we should go and sometimes you ask God to do something. Sometimes you just might have a dream. Sometimes you just might have a desire. Whether you want to call it dream, desire, whatever, tonight I'm calling it a dream. And you got that dream, and that dream's not a bad thing. That dream's not a sin. That dream's not something that anybody can look at you and say, well, the Bible says you shouldn't have that dream. You shouldn't have that goal, if you will. But nevertheless, God has answers for us, and he has a plan for us. So I want to preach with this thought in mind tonight, when God says no. When God says no. Look at our passage tonight. It says that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar. What basically that means is basically what we would consider. He lived in a mansion. He lived in the best of the best of, that anybody could have. No one could top what David was living in. He said, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And in other passages, it'll say it dwelled in a tent. He says, I'm bothered by this, is that I'm living here in luxury, and God's ark is in a tent. So David had a desire. He said, hey, here's what I want to do. He says, I want to put that ark in a permanent house. So as we see here, we go along, we see David, as we know him, he was a man of war. David is a man of battle. David is a man that has experience in dealing with very stressful situations in his life. They fought much different back then than we fight wars now. Not to diminish the way we fight wars, but back then it was a little bit more personal. It was a little bit more strategic. It was a little, you just didn't go out and do things. You, you, you better have God on your side and you better know what you were doing. David, a man of war, battle experience, used to stressful situations. 
Look what it said in verse number 1. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him, what's that next word? Rest. Rest. Round about him from all his enemies. We find David here now, he's at peace. Not only we find him kind of laid back, we see David's at a point in his life, there are no giants to fight, there's no battle plans being made, there's no strategic meetings going on, there's no seeking counsel from God about should we fight, should we not fight. David is at a place in his life where he's at rest. I don't know about you, but those kind of places are where I find myself in trouble. And we know later on David did find himself in trouble when he was at home when he should have been fighting. But at this place, he's at perfect rest, and I believe it was God ordained that he be at rest. He was at rest not only at home, everything was going great at home, but he was also at rest as a nation. There wasn't any uprising going on. Nobody's trying to take the throne from him. The enemies have left him alone. David is at perfect peace. So now his brain starts turning and he starts thinking, okay, what what do I need to do now? And he began pondering and he says, I'm sitting here at rest in this nice house and God's ark is dwelling in a tent. So we see his desire and we see Nathan here. This is the first time you find the mention of Nathan in the Bible. And we know who Nathan is. He's a prophet. He's a man of God. And he backs up David and he says, hey, go on and do that which is in your heart. This is the man that is for David. We know who he is. He's the man later on that we find that he goes back to David and he says, Thou art the man. But right now, this is the first time we see him. David's got a desire and it doesn't specifically lay out what his desire is right here. He just says, I'm dwelling in a nice house. God's ark is in a tent. And Nathan says, Go do what you feel like you need to do. The problem is, is Nathan hasn't inquired from the Lord either. They all have these dreams. Like I said, they're not bad things, but they're dreams nevertheless that they want to do. What do we find here? What has just happened? Why is David so focused on this ark? What brings his attention to say, why is this ark so important? We understand, we read that the ark represents one thing. The presence and the power of God. Wherever the ark is, there are blessings to come with it. If you look at the previous chapters, you see that David has went after the ark and he has now brought the ark back to Jerusalem. He's brought the ark back home, if you will. So we see this and we see that he wants to make it a permanent home. David has no ulterior motive here. He doesn't have anything to prove. He's not trying to have self-ambition and try to say, look at what I've done. I believe in complete innocence, Brother Galloway. David has came to the place that he's really, really thinking and saying, hey, I'm in a nice house, therefore God's ark should be in a nice house. The problem is this. Some dreams or desires, they may be of God. Some of them are not. You better be careful in determining whether the desire, the dream that you have in your heart is God-ordained or self-ordained. So we see that David had this desire, and then we see that David had an answer from God. If you look at 2 Samuel chapter number 7, verses 4, you'll see it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me in house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelled in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from the following uh, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel. So we see this, this discussion between God and Nathan, and Nathan's supposed to go to David and tell him, say, Hey, I've been wandering in these tents and these tabernacles since day one. Not one time did I have a discussion with Israel or anybody else, say, hey, why don't y'all build my ark a permanent house of cedar? See, this is all David conjuring this thing up. And we see what's going on here. And David's answer is, no. 
You say, where did you find that at? If you'll turn just a couple pages over to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter number 17. 1 Chronicles chapter number 17. First Chronicles 17 verses 3 to 4 says, And it came to pass the same night that the word of God came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt, what's that next word? Not, Not build me a house to dwell in. See, in 2 Samuel we find the question. Are you the one that's supposed to build a house for me? But we find in the parallel passage that what was really said is, no, you're not going to build me a house. David's got this great dream. He's at peace. He said, hey, this is a good thing. This is what I think we need to do. Then Nathan, the very man that said, David, you had a great dream. Go do that which is in your heart. But now Nathan comes back and said, here's what God said. You're not going to build me a house. I don't know about you, but I don't like being told no. I don't know anybody that says, I enjoy being told no. We want to hear yes. And you say, well, there's nothing worse than no. Well, I could disagree with that. I hate the word wait. <laughs> but no is a definite answer. Wait, at least it can still go the other way. But I, 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 to me, wait is worse than no. But here David is told no. So we go on and we see this thing unfolding here and and you're like, how did David take this? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in this passage, as you read along, it goes along that God did not only tell him no, but God went a step further and said, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to build my house. But your son is. So at least God didn't leave him hanging. See, the thing about it is when we get aggravated at God sometimes, we ask him for a prayer, we ask him for something specific, and God tells us, no, we get mad. Hello? And we're just like, I don't understand it. Well, you don't have to understand it, but if you'll stick with God close enough and you'll, and you'll keep asking him, he'll tell you why he said no. He doesn't have to tell you. We do this with kids. Well, why that? Because I said so. I'm glad God's not like that. Now, he can be that way, but he didn't leave David hanging. He said, hey, you're not going to build me a house, but I'm going to let your son build it for me. Now, I don't know about you, but there's one thing that can creep in right here. Pride. Who do you know had a better reputation than David? He was a nobody. He was a shepherd. He was a kid. He took on a giant. He killed him. And we go fast forward years. Now he's in the house of cedar. He's a king. No nation around him is messing with him right now. He's at peace. He's kind of like the man. Who else better to build the house of God than the man? You know what God said? You're not building it. And David, and you would say, well, he probably pitched a fit. Oh, no, let's, let's look at it. So we see the, David's desire. We see his answer from God and Here's was basically God's answer to David. David, you're a soldier, not a builder. You know what? God has a specific plan for your life. God has a specific plan for my life. And we might think we can do somebody else's job. But that job is for them, not for you. And you say, what are you talking about? David, did he have probably engineers? Did he probably have the materials? Did he have the finances? Did he have everything to back up everything to build this house and do it right? Sure he did. But it wasn't David's place to do that. God said, no, you're not going to do it. So here's what David did. When you look in um, um, 2 Chronicles, um, turn your Bible to 2 Chronicles, chapter number 6. Look at a couple verses here because I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to see it. Second Chronicles chapter number 6. We're talking about David's acceptance of God's answer of no. Second Chronicles 6. Look at verse number 7 through 9. Now, it was in the heart of David my father to build an house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, For as much 
As it was in thine heart to build a house for my name, I love this phrase, thou didst well in that it was in thine heart. Notwithstanding, thou shalt not build the house. See, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to point out is David accepted the answer, and here's was God's response to David's desire. Thou didst well that it was in your heart, but it wasn't for you to do. So a lot of times we look at people and we have dreams and say, well, those are selfish dreams. You had, it, you had ulter, uh, ul, ulterior motives. I'm trying to speak in Portuguese here just a minute. But you, you have other motives. You're trying to prove a point. You're trying, no, it might have been out of, just out of the deep goodness of his heart that he wanted to do something for God. And God said, no, but I'm glad you had it in your heart. God give us people that have a desire to do something in their heart. But God give us people that have a desire to do something that when God says no, you can take it like a man or a woman and say, all right, God, if you said no, then your plan fall in place. Here's what the problem is. Most of us will say, well, God said no because there must be sin in the life. God help. I am so sick and tired of this super spiritual crowd that they think they're better than everybody else and they've got an answer for everything and, and then they become the judge and jury. Hey, just because God told you you can't do something don't mean you had bad motives. Doesn't mean that you've got sin in your life. It doesn't mean that God is causing discipline to come upon your life. It just might be very well that it's just not for you to do. You know, we look at men and you go to men and say, well, if you're not, and I've had preachers tell me this, and I could list the names, but I'm not going to do that because I know we're on the internet. And uh, I'm kind of one of those, I don't back down one from a fight, so don't put me in the corner. <laughs> but they're saying, well, you're out of the will of God because you're not pastoring the church right now. Well, who made them God? You say, well, you're not using what God, and I don't believe a preacher should sit on his rear end. I don't think God calls a man to preach to let him sit down and warm the pews. You say, well, the pastor don't preach me at my church. Well, buddy, there's street corners, there's nursing homes, there's jails, there's all kinds of places that you can preach. And if you got preaching in your heart and God, and God don't tell the pastor to preach you in a church, you'll find somewhere to preach. Hey, the thought ever occurred to you that the pastor don't ask you to preach because you don't preach anywhere else? <laughs> But a lot of people say, well, they start carrying on and they start putting, well, you can't do this because of this and, well, God must be doing it. How about us just stay out of everybody else's lives and mind our own business and do what God has you to do, our family to do, and forget what everybody else is doing? You know, we've come to the place, Brother Randy, where we look at everybody else and we're not looking at ourselves. We, we could preach all night and, and, and talk about, hey, man, you got a splinter in your eye and I got two cedars of Lebanon sticking out of each one of my eyes. You know, God help us just to pay attention to what God has us to do. David, and i got to get off of that because that rabbit just showed up and I I'm, I'm want to pull out a shotgun. But people say, you're out of God's will. You're running from God. You must not be right with God, and that's why God's not allowing you to do that. It might not be none of those reasons. It might just be a very simple thing that God said no. There's no underlying cause of that other than that God wants somebody else to do it. Hey, just because it's in your heart doesn't mean that it's the will of God. Hey, if that was the case, Brother Ben, I'd be in Brazil right now. If it was the case that if it's in my heart and I have a desire and I have a burden, I'd be in Brazil. You know what aggravates me? I'm just, can I just be, I'm just being honest. I told you this message is for me tonight. My dad can't do the things he used to do. He's not physically able. He has that same spunk. I don't see people lining up to go to Brazil. Here's the thing. I don't need to learn the culture. I don't need to learn the language. Here's a better one. I don't even need support. I was born there. I could get a job there. I could be a bivocational pastor like everybody else. God said, And we go on and we look and like, man, there's things that can be done. I went to Italy on a business trip a few years ago and not one church, brother, David, not one. I was sitting there eating and the owner of the business where I was at, we became good friends. He loves Brazil, so we hooked up right off the bat. And every time we'd go out and eat, he'd buy the finest wine. He'd buy the finest food. 
and I wouldn't drink. And he's like, why don't you drink? I said, because I don't drink. And I kind of left it at that at first. Say, were you ashamed? He said, no, I just didn't feel like beating him over the head. First go around. And it intrigued him. I'll say, well, why don't you drink wine? Because in Italy, they have a saying. If you don't drink wine with them, you're either a thief or a spy. I said, well, a thief's a bad thing. So I said, I guess I'm a spy. <laughs> and he began asking. And I told him, he said, he said what kind, is this kind of religion thing? I said, well, I believe it's what the Bible teaches us. And I said, we should abstain from the appearance of evil and so forth. And he said, what religion are you? I said, we're Baptists. I'm not kidding, Brother Kyle. He looked at me and said, what's a Baptist? Mind you, this is the area where the Bible started before it ever came to the U.S. I have a burden for those people. I can't go. God said no. We look at David and his acceptance of this. Hey, just because in your heart don't mean it's his will. So what did David do? Go back to 2 Samuel chapter number 7. 2 Samuel chapter number 7. This is something I'm trying to indirectly instill in my kids in a roundabout way. You'll see where I'm going with this. 2 Samuel chapter number 7 verse 18. Then went King David in and what did he do? He sat. Where? Before the Lord. Hey, you know what? You know what most of us want to do? We got a desire in our heart. We go chase it. We try to everything in our power to make it happen. Right. We're not patient on waiting on the answer. We go ahead and do it and we make a wreck out of it. You know what we need to do when the man of God gets up and, and you know what's interesting about this passage is is that David had a desire to do something. The man of God said go ahead and do what's in your heart. Then he goes away and the Lord talks to the man of God. The man of God comes back and says to David, God said no. The response of David is he went and sat not before Nathan. He went and sat before the Lord. Right. Here's what we do. We got a desire in our heart and the preacher's like, man, that sounds like a great idea. And the preacher gets up and preaches a message and gives us the answer directly or indirectly. And then we go, we want to argue with a man of God about it. Why don't you go and sit before the Lord and talk about it? When you look at David, and I ain't got time to develop all these verses. I'm trying to hurry up, Brother Kyle. And uh, he, you go down, and, and basically what David did, he said, Who am I? What is my house? And he begins to look at all the things. He said, Hey, look at where you brought me from. Look at where you've placed me. He said, If it wasn't for you, I would be a nobody. And David said, I'm going to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. And I accept your answer, and I support your answer. Let me ask you, when was the last time you did that? David sat down and reflected. He, he, he started looking at his blessings, and now we find David has a new purpose. You know, it's one thing that most of us, and this is why I do this, is that when we're told no, what do we do with it? What do you do with it? You forget it about it and go on about your business. David didn't do that. Look at what David does, David's purpose. Did he support God's plan? Well, of course he did. Look at 1st Chron keep your fingers on 2 Samuel, but go to back to 1st Chronicles chapter number 22. 1st Chronicles 22. 1st Chronicles 22 verse number 1. Then David said, "This is the house of the Lord God." And this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. And David commanded to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel. And he set, uh, and he set masons to, rock, to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors of the gates, and for the joinings and brass in abundance without weight. Also cedar trees in abundance for the Zidonians. And they, and, and they of Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, and the house that is to be builded for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent, I can't say that word, of fame and of glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. Here's David's answer to it. He said, hey, I got a desire to build a house for God. God said, no, you're not. 
Your son's going to do it. David didn't get mad, storm off and say, forget it. My son can have at it. No, here's what David did. He said, I'll tell you what, my son, he's inexperienced. He's young. He said, but what I'm going to do, he said, I'm going to give him everything I got. So I'm going to get the best wood there is. I'm going to have it prepared. I'm going to get all the iron. We're going to melt it down. We're going to have nails. He said, what are you doing? He said, when it comes time for my son to build this temple, he's going to have everything at his disposal. Let me ask you this. What are you doing to help prepare the job for somebody else? We say, well, I didn't get that promotion, that job. I think I deserve to be that next, that, the one that should have got it. And the person up under me is going to get the job. I don't think that's fair. It ain't about you. It's about God. We say, well, God's not fair. <laughs> Life's not fair. Like I said, who's getting the glory for it, you or God? Let me ask you, that guy that don't like you, that guy that hates you, and he won't have nothing to do with you or your faith or your religion or your church, he just thinks you're a, wasting your time and he's an atheist and so forth, he gets the promotion, but your answer to it is, hey, buddy, I heard you get that promotion. What can I do to help make your life easier? I want you to be the best boss ever, and I've got your back. Man, what kind of statement would that make? You know, David didn't pout. David didn't say, well, that's fine. I won't do anything. He said, no, I'm going to prepare everything. I'm going to make sure everything is ready for it. And that way, when he gets to that point, I've done most of the work. All he's got to do is put it all together. You know, I've seen a lot of preachers stab a lot of preachers in the back because they didn't get the church. And then they'll do everything in their power to try to ruin that man so they can get that church. God help us. Hey, it might not just be ministry. It could be education. There's not a jealous bone in my body. I just want to make sure that public, Brother Love, knows that. I don't want that job. <laughs> Me and my uncle were having this conversation. I told him, he said, well, he said, well, I thought about offering it to you and talking to you. I was like, I don't want it. That's not what I can tell you. That's not what God wants me to do right now. Maybe in the future, kind of like Brother Love. He didn't think that later in years he'd be over at school, and now he is. And, but I tell you what. I didn't ask for the position, but I tell you what, he has a position. Maybe somebody in here goes, well, I don't think he should have the position. Well, it don't matter what you think. God said no to your plans. Not trying to be arrogant, not trying to be ugly, but let me ask you this. Is your answer like David's? Hey, brother, love, what do you need? What do you need done? Is there anything that I have a skill set for that you can use? Is there anything I can do to make your life easier? Yeah. Pastor, yeah, you became pastor of this church, and, you know, I didn't think Brother Robin should be gone. I think somebody else should have been pastor. And, you know, well, you, you're not the pastor that I asked for, but what can I do for you, preacher? Hey. How can I help you? Yeah. Hey, when's the last time you walked up to your boss <laughs> at work and said, hey, I, I, we might not get along, but, hey, I want you to be the best boss ever, and I want to be your best employee and not just, you know, trying to... Uh, br brown nose or whatever but what can I do for you to make your life easier how do you accept no it's kind of quiet you know what the real sign of, of humility is is when you support a no agree with a no but support somebody else's yes Hey, I'm going to tell you, that's easy preaching. <laughs> it's hard living. I'm telling you, like I said personally, I, I would give my right leg, and that's not a pun, but I'd give my right leg to be full-time preaching. Me and Brother Randy talked a little bit about it. I don't care if it's missionary, pastor, assistant pastor, evangelist. I don't care. I just want to be at it. You know what God's saying right now? Nope. One day it might turn into a yes, but right now it's no. So what are you doing right now? I'm going to support everybody I can. If a door opens, I'm going to go for it. And if the pastor needs anything, says, hey, I need you. He called me and says, hey, can you preach Sunday night? Absolutely, I'll preach Sunday night. Did it, was I, you know, Lord help. I'm going to try not to chase rabbits. Well, why did he ask Brother Love to preach Sunday morning? Why couldn't I preach Sunday morning? You're an idiot. <clears throat> you know, I used to do that. I didn't do it this time. 
Say, you, I think I've grown, I hope I've grown a little bit better than that, Brother Brian. But there's a lot of preachers that do that. I've done it. Well, why does he only preach me on Wednesday nights? I don't ever get to preach Sundays. You can't take no. Until you learn to accept no, you're never going to learn the benefits of supporting somebody else's yes. Did, did you get that? It doesn't matter if it's ministry or work. You need to have a purpose for your no. So last of all, I'd like to look at this. It's David's lesson for us. <laughs> I've already got a lot of lessons out of it, but just to finish up and conclude this thing tonight. A no, here's the thing. We look at no as a negative thing, right? We all look at that. Yes is positive, no is negative. I, I, if, if you don't get anything else out of this message, I want you to get this. I want you to take no as a positive. Say, so how in the world can you get no, a positive out of a no? That's a negative statement. No could have this definition. There's a better way. There's a better plan. We can magnify God through the works of others. That's where the rubber hits the road. The reason most of us can accept no's is because we want our name. To be out there. We are, are the ones that want the pats on the back. We are the ones that people, we want people to recognize. Hey, when you have that attitude, God's not getting the glory. And, and I could make, I actually made a statement. I, could, I actually thought about it after I said it at the Jubilee. And I was like, after I said it, I was like, I can't believe you said that. I got home and my wife said, I can't believe you said that. I said, I can't either, but it's too late. But there's people that are after the spotlight. There are people, hey, I'll tell you how you know if somebody's really being used of God or not. After they do something that they're involved in, whether it be preaching, singing, it don't matter, whatever it is. If after it's over, all they talk about is, did you see how they responded to what I said? Did you see how people came up and talked to me? Did you see all the attention that I got? Did you see what I did? Or they might say this, did you see that while I was doing that, did you see what they did? You notice all the focus is level? It's all ground level. But then you got the fellow that you walk up, and I got to spend almost two weeks with Brother Joe Arthur, and he hasn't changed since I, since I was a kid. After church, he would go, son, I just don't know why God. Focus went up. Say, why is that man used all over the country? Because his focus is not about him. Well, say, well, that's easy to say when your name's on the poster everywhere. Hey, you know how it got there? He didn't care. You know what's funny? Everybody trying to be like Brother Larry Raines. Everybody, try, everybody trying to be like James Jones. Everybody trying to be like Joe Walther. And those guys never asked for one minute of attention. They just want to do what God wants them to do. And you say... Well, they get to do everything that they want to do. Oh, no, I've sat down and talked to them a lot. Brother Barry, you have too. Well, I heard him, but I don't see him. There he is. There's a lot of no's. We could talk about history, about all the men. Say, so well, look at Abraham Lincoln. He was president of the United States. Yeah, but look at all the failures he had in his life before he became president. Hey, you're not going to be successful in your Christian life or your material life until you learn to deal with the no's in your life. How to handle when God says no. Two simple answers. Cooperation and humility. Hey, you work together and you have a humble spirit, it'll go a long ways. I got two quotes and I'm done. I've done lost my stuff. Maybe I'm not going to read it. Oh, here they are. I don't read as much as I used to. I need to go back to reading. I asked Brother McBride one time, I said, how in the world can you be so smart? <laughs> Found out he reads a lot. Brother James Dobson, you might not agree with everything man does, I don't either, but he made this statement. 
about the time that our face clears up, our mind gets fuzzy. Just about the time we get our act together, we're too old to pull it off. Let me read that again. About the time our face clears up, our mind gets fuzzy. Just about the time we get our act together, we're too old to pull it off. I tell you what in the world has that got to do with anything you're preaching? Hey, they are those that think you've got to have one foot in a grave and one foot on a banana pill before you can do anything for God. I've met them. You don't have enough experience to pastor that church. <clears throat> Where's that in the Bible? Hey, if God called him to that church, he'll give him all the experience he needs. But Larry Raines, I sat up under him for years. He pastored one church. He didn't start with a small church and work up to Pleasant View what it is. Or you know where I'm going with that. Throw him in there. He learned as he went. Because that's what God wants. And there are those that God puts them in smaller churches and work their way up. Hey, I'm not going to argue God's plan. What I'm saying is this. By the time your face clears up from all that acne, your brain starts going. I'm 36 and my brain's already went. Some of you say you never had a brain. <clears throat> and by the time you get your act together, you're too old to do it. So what's your point? Point is, what are you doing to prepare for the next person behind you? That's ultimately what's in this passage. God told David no. He had every capability. He had every financial prosperity. He had all the materials. He had all the men. He had everything to make this work. But God said no. But David was the one that put everything together for Solomon. So we see the plan there, the purpose, the lesson. I'm going to read this poem and I'm done. One by one, he took them from me, all the things I valued most, until I was empty-handed, every glittering toy was lost. And I walked earth's highways grieving in my rags and poverty, till I heard his voice inviting Lift those empty hands to me. So I held my hands toward heaven, and he filled them with the store of his own transcendent riches till they could contain no more. And at last I comprehended with my stupid mind and dull that God could not pour his riches into hands that were already full. As the pianist comes and gets ready for the invitation, here's the thing I got to ask for you. Those dreams, going back to the beginning of the message, and I'm concluding. Those dreams, hey, they might be of God and they might not be. But here's what most of us are doing. If you allow this handkerchief to be my dream, we'll get that dream and we'll fill our hands with that dream. And we want God to do something with that dream. And sometimes God says, no. But we go the rest of our lives and we're holding on to that, that dream, that desire. And we miss out on what everything that God has for us. What God wants you to do is just take that desire and that dream. Watch me. Say, well, God, you're not doing anything in my life. Why don't you get rid of that desire? Why don't you get rid of that dream? Because God's already told you, no. You can help somebody else with that dream. You can help somebody else with that purpose. But you're missing out on it. When you let go and you lift your hands towards heaven, God can put other things in your hands. You want to know why you, got, you don't have anything in your hands? You got them full. God's already told you no, and you keep hanging on to it. Hey, why don't you let go and let God you do some, put something else in your hand? I tell people all the time, hey, there's better pianists than me. There's better musicians than me. I play some different instruments. I'm not good at either one of them, Brother Randy. 
There's people that can preach better than me. That don't take much. There's people that can teach better than me. Hey, there's people that can run an AT&T store better than I can. They're out there. They're better than I am. But here's one thing, Brother Landon. Hell, nobody enjoy it more than I do. I love what I do. I love what I get to do. I don't want to be found guilty, Brother Randy, of holding on to something that God said, no. I want to keep my hands empty. Keep them raised toward the heavens where God can say, now's the yes. Here's your yes. But a lot of times people do not get yeses in their lives because you never understood what to do when God says no. Brother Kyle. Have thine own way. Have thine own way.